I'm Daniel Grunberg, and today I will talk about generating dash CC1 command lines from compiler invocation instances. I started this work as a remote summer intern at Apple. Let's get started. First, let's talk about why we did all this work in the first place. And the answer to that is module support, and I'll explain to you why. As a quick reminder, modules replace textual preprocessor includes with imports of serialized ASTs found in .pcm files. We're interested in explicit module builds enabled by Clang Scan Depths, which is a tool that was presented by Michael Spencer and Alex Lawrence at the 2019 Brussels Developer Meeting. Clang Scan Depths scans a project and discovers the modular dependencies within it and reports them back to the underlying build system along with the command lines that can build the module. Let's go through an example. Clank scandep starts scanning and discovers transition unit A, which depends on the transforms module, which in turn depends on IR and analysis. Next, we find B, which is compatible with A and also depends on transforms. Because they are compatible, we can reuse the same set of modules. Next, we discover C, which also depends on transforms and transitively on IR and analysis, but it's incompatible with A and B, and therefore it needs an entire new set of modules. Clang Scan Depths is a parallel tool, so we might discover the dependency on transforms either through A or through B first, and this would lead to reporting a different command line to the build system. This is bad because non deterministic command lines are confusing for the build system. And the reason why is that the build system believes the modules to be invalidated every time the command line changes. And therefore, it will rebuild the modules on every scan, potentially. Clang Scan Depths has access to compiler invocation underlying each translation unit. And what we want to do is to be able to generate a deterministic command line from first principles based on the compiler invocation alone. But before we talk about that, let's talk about the changes that were necessary to CC1's option parser in order to enable this new use case. We added these mix-ins to the table gen definitions that can be attached to the option declarations. These specify how to parse the option and conversely how to generate a command line option for it. The major categories are displayed on the slide. I'll give you now a few seconds to read through them. Table gen processes these options into macro definitions. I've highlighted the important fields. The key pass is the subfield of compiler invocation for which this option is responsible for. Next, we have the normalizer. The normalizer takes the argument list and is responsible for extracting a value suitable for storage in the key pass for this option. Finally, we have the merger, which takes this value and stores it in the key pass in whatever way is correct. Let's talk about how we use these macro definitions to generate deterministic command lines. We use the same macros, but I've highlighted a slightly different set of parameters this time. The key pass is still the underlying subfield of compiler invocation. But now we have the counterparts of normalizer and merger, the denormalizer and extractor. Respectively, the extractor is responsible for extracting a value suitable for consumption by the denormalizer from the key pass. So once the value is extracted from the key pass, the denormalizer can consume it and generate an option for CC1. People add options somewhat frequently to the front end, and we didn't want this behavior to accidentally get broken in this process. So the first thing we did was move all the subfields of compiler invocation into their own .def file databases. And this enabled us to implement the following check. Once a compiler invocation is parsed from a command line, we generate a command line 